In my last video, I made bread. So I guess I was Chef John. In this one, I'm going to be doing something a little bit more nerdy. So I guess this time around, I'm Professor John. <laughs> and um, this has to do with the video where I made the crossovers for my new speakers over here. And uh, I mentioned in another video before this that the video has gotten more views. And it seems like every day I'm getting a comment from people telling me that I shouldn't put the coils in the orientation that I did in the video. In the video, I put them, they were separated by the capacitors, but they were on the same plane. What I have here is I've got my uh, oscilloscope on the bottom. This is connected to this coil right here. And it, you can't see it on the screen, but I'll get it in closer so you can. You'll see that even me touching the coil will cause interference to show up on the scope. So just touching it or putting my hand on it or taking, say, a, a metal plate and putting near it will cause it to do things. But that would be noise. That wouldn't be the mutual inductance that we're talking about here. In the other coil that I have that I held up just a few seconds ago, I've got my uh, function generator connected to that and it's sending a 500 hertz sine wave into this coil. So when you bring this coil close to the other coil, what will happen is you will have mutual inductance. You'll have what happens in a transformer. I mean, a transformer is basically two or more coils stacked and one has the electricity flowing through it and it's induction that causes the electricity to flow in the other coil. Usually there's an iron bar in the middle or some steel thing to help with that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this coil and I'm going to bring it closer to the coil that's connected to the scope and you will be able to see what happens on the scope. So what you're watching here is as one coil gets closer to the other, you can see that there is some thing happening. There's an output, a sine wave on the scope. But as I turn the coil 90 degrees vertically to the coil, that minimizes that. In fact, there's very little going through. And then turning it the other way is less effective, but it still reduces it by quite a bit, actually. So as you can see, it is effective. There's no disputing that. It's just how much of a factor is it? Does it make that much of a difference when you're building like the kind of crossover that I built? If you do that, are you going to go out of your way? Because obviously when you stand a coil up, it's going to be a little bit more difficult to mount. Also, it's going to take up more space in the box because that coil is going to be standing up. And some of these coils can be pretty big. So in my circumstance, like I said, both coils were flat on the piece of plexiglass that I made out of. But they were separated by the distance of the capacitors in between. I knew about mutual inductions and I knew how much of a factor it is. And I knew that basically it wouldn't be a problem if I had enough distance between the two coils. And I'll just put the coils where, approximately where they were in the uh, crossover. And you can see, yes, there is a little bit of activity on the scope, indeed. But how much of a factor is that? For the audiophiles in the audience, of course, this will be a huge factor. Anything like that would be crazy insane to have happening on the other coil. But in reality, can you actually hear that? So to demonstrate this again, I'm going to disconnect this coil from uh, the thing. And I'm going to put this straight into the speaker. Okay? So... I'll just do this temporarily. You'll hear how loud the signal is coming out of the function generator, not anything else. So you can hear that. No problem. I can hear it. Okay, now I'm going to connect that thing back up to the coil. Now I'm going to disconnect the scope. Or actually, I don't, probably don't have to. I'll just connect the lead straight to that. And listen and see if you can hear this. I can't hear it.
I can't hear a peep. I can't hear a thing. I'm going to put it in closer. Like, I'll take the other coil and get it over here closer. And we'll try it again. I can just barely hear that. And that's sitting right on top of the other coil. <laughs> yes, there's an effect. But how significant is the effect? This is something I've been harping on for like every project. Every project you had, you'll do, you'll get somebody nitpicking about a detail that is purely, purely insignificant to the you know, overall uh, success or failure of the project or utility of the project or even the appearance of the project. They'll nitpick about a certain little thing. Another comment that has frequently come up in that video is about the way I made the coil, about how I um, calculated the inductance by weighing it. And I knew this was going to come up. I knew it. And since then, I've taken the uh, tweeter out of this one right here to refinish it. Because remember, I, I dropped that and it got scratched up. So took it out. And while I was doing that, I took out the woofer too. I pulled out the insulation. I pulled out the crossover that was in there. And I actually measured the coils that I hand wound from weight. And they were off. Of course, I knew they would be. Um, I, pretty sh I can't remember the exact figures. Uh, what I, the way I used to measure the coils, because I don't have an inductance meter, is I used to um, uh, multimeter. <laughs> That's what they're called. Two of those and a, uh, a known resistor to compare it to that. So it was fairly accurate. I was able to measure ones that I already had and, and so kind of calibrated it that way. So I knew it was accurate. The ones that I made for here were supposed to be like 0.7 and 0.9. And I think they wound up being point, like 0.55 for the 0.7 and, and 0.7 for the uh, 0.9 one. So they were a little low, but a little low is not that bad. And that's another thing that people obsess over is how close these filters need to be. They don't have to be bang on the money because usually when somebody designs a crossover for a speaker like this, like a professional, he'll start with what is textbook, basically, as in these are the uh, values for the filters that you have to make. And you make that, and then you listen to this thing. And if you don't like the way it sounds, because that all often happened, this is one place where listening to the speaker actually, and, and not measuring it, comes in. It's in cr crossover design. You'll make changes to those values. You'll either use a, a bigger coil or a smaller coil. You'll change those slopes. You'll change the crossover point. You'll change the slopes between the crossover points even as well so that you actually have a bit of a dip in the mid-range because a lot of speakers sound better when the bass and the treble are slightly higher than the mid-range output because our hearing is most sensitive in the mid-range. So what's the moral of this story, John? Well, it's to, like I've said in many other videos before, usually on this channel, I think, it's to not get lost in the details. They say the devil's in the details with stuff. Yes, but, you know, insanity is also in the details. And the other thing that's in the, in the details is not getting the project done. That's also in the details. Also in that is spending too much money on the project because you need this exact thing and you can't do it without it. It's nonsense. Just do the project. If it's a speaker like this, make it, um, listen to it. If it sounds good, it is good. No buzzkill credit checks. No rip-off minimum down payments. That's not your bag. But check this out. Fully equipped kitchen with automatic self-cleaning oven and breakfast nook. Out of sight. Attached one car and available two-car garage. And best of all, a view of the Dominguez flood control channel that can only be described in two words. Right on. <laughs>